And welcome, friends, to this, the Thursday edition of the Grace Hour, broadcasting live from our studios, which, of course, are located at the home of the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore, Maryland. And welcome to the Thursday edition of our broadcast, friends. Great to be with you this morning. My name is Pastor John Love. Joining me in the studio today is Pastor Thomas Schaller, and we'll be your hosts for the next 45 minutes or so. And we will continue to develop our theme this week on the Grace Hour. And today, focusing in particular on helping parents stay the course in their parenting. And I think that this is a, a critical need for the hour in which we find ourselves living in, in our culture today. So we hope you'll stay with us. And of course, we invite you to participate in the broadcast. We'll keep the phone lines open during the entire podcast. And you can pick up your phone and dial one of these numbers and join us live with your comments, questions, and weigh in, share your thoughts about a theme and a subject that no doubt touches so many of us, uh, especially, of course, if you are a parent and or have been a parent in the sense that your children perhaps are now grown, uh, but we'd love to hear what your thoughts are as we discuss this theme together. We, uh, we do want to thank you for taking the time to join us, and here are those numbers. Toll free in all of North America is 800-338-7060. Again, that is the toll-free number. Uh, wherever you're listening to the broadcast today in North America, or, uh, well, yes, throughout North America, 800-338-7060. Locally, here in the Baltimore area, 410-483-3700. And we look forward to taking your calls and comments, questions. And, of course, if you can't pick up a phone and join us, uh, you can join the chat line here and share your thoughts with us that way. Um, helping parents stay the course in their parenting. Um, an interesting theme, uh, Pastor Shallow, to say the least. Uh, we have raised children. Now we are looking at our children raise their children. Um, and and it's, a, it's a challenge, to say the least. Um, mm. I, I remember, I think it was James Dobson when he used to host Focus on the Family. They asked him, you know, about raising teenagers in particular. He says, what's, you know, can you give us your... Your, your thoughts on it, you know, kind of summation of everything that you would have to go, could contribute to what it means to raise teens. And he just said, you just dig your ditches and stay there until you get the job done. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. In other words, he was saying that we, what we heard from Pastor Stevens for many, many years uh, on a lot of different subjects and themes, don't quit. You don't give up. Don't advocate that position. Don't pass it off to the professionals to get that job done. Parenting is our responsibility. They're our children. And we have been given that responsibility to, to raise them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, it, when we say stay the course, maybe we should define what is the, you know, stay the course. Well, we are born again Christians have a relationship with God, and that relationship really means a lot to us in, in uh, life. Like it says in Proverbs 22, 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. If your goal for your children is that they would be, have great riches, then that's like not the course or you want them to become famous, or you'd like them to be very successful, or have a family, or... So when we say stay the course, like, what is our target? Yeah, I, that, that's the perfect question, and I think uh, Paul brought out in his last letter that he wrote to Timothy that there was a course that was mapped out for him by God, and he wanted to finish that course. He wanted to complete that race. So there is a course, there is a... A design, there is a plan that God has for us. And to discover that, well, it, I, I guess it makes the job a lot easier mm -hmm. when you know, mm -hmm. you know where you're going and what your direction is. Mm -hmm. What would that be for you if in your family we're talking about parenting? And like I always think of um, the 25 years old, they're, they're one year old and they need to be brought up when they're. Uh, very young, like that, toddlers, and then they go to kindergarten, five years old. Then let's say 11, 11, and then there's the preteen time, 11 to 13. Then the 13 to 18, the teens. 
Uh, so even though they are developing and growing, like what are maybe, I don't know, two or three fundamental uh, elements that are needed for their survival, uh, physical survival, psychological health, spiritual um, orientation? In my mind, uh, the biggest and most important priority for a young person is to help them to establish an identity as early on as possible. Now, again, a lot of young people, they might not be able to successfully do that in a complete way as they become adolescents or teenagers. But even if you get them on that, on that road and they start to move in that direction, that's going to be critically important because without a sense of identity, it's difficult to tackle any real goals and purpose and objective in life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember growing up and I could sense the pressure, let's say for instance, from my parents um, when I was a teenager, like, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to become? And it, 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 those kinds of questions only, well, they, they weren't even relevant because I didn't know who I was. Oh, I see. If I didn't un have a sense of identity, how am mm -hmm. I gonna go out and pursue any goals and objectives or have any purpose in my life? Mm -hmm. You know, they would, they would use others to kind of stimulate me and, and get me in the right, you know, your sister is, she's in college and she's going to become this or that. What are you going to do? I, I could only, you know, if this co conversation happened on a Thursday, the future for me was Friday night. That's as yeah. far into the future as I could see because I just didn't know who I was. Yes. And I think that the scriptures and, you know, being in a, a healthy local church goes a long way to helping a young person establish their sense of identity because mm -hmm. at a young age, you start to pour into them who they are in Christ. And, and I, I remember staying up with my youngest daughter before she'd go to bed every night, we said that we were going to do the I am game. And, and she would just say, I am, and, and I would give the word, and I would say, a believer, and she would say, I am a believer. Um, you know, I am loved by God. We would just do this, and I would just throw one phrase or one word after another, and she would just say those things until she was ready to fall asleep. Oh, okay. It was a great way to do it, to yeah. just establish, you know, you are wonderful, you are amazing, you are godly, you are gifted, and you just start to say these things, and, you know, who knows, they might just believe it after yeah, some yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it myself because I had to be creative too because every night, and I didn't want to say the same things all the time, so I had to be <laughs> a little creative. Okay, okay. So uh, in the Bible, we have the book of Proverbs, which is really for training young people and, and all of us to think the right way and i think when when it says a good name is rather to be chosen i think of um a balanced person uh now let's say they, they've grown up you've raised your children they're now 25 years old 22 years old maybe even 28 years old but they they what what, what are you looking for well well they, they would have uh a, a healthy, balanced life, and understand that the the values of life, the important things of life, the love, love is a good word. Um, the, uh, the sense of their their the meaning of life, you know, like Jesus, the greatest commandment is the love of God. But we all know that you don't get there by just saying it to people. But uh, they catch it by watching the parents. Well, let's talk about the husband and wife dynamic. If you have children, but then there are many single parents. But um, the ch the parent in the, in with their friends or in a local in a in a in a community. Uh, to local church or in a community, the friends, and then the um, the love that is there. So, what what uh, um, what would you say would be the end of the end game in parenting? 
I think, as you said, the, the example in the home is, is so crucial. Uh, we've heard it said, you know, over and over again that the best thing that parents can do for their children is for a husband to love his wife. And if they see that, um, they, they take, they take notice of that mm -hmm. and they, they, they just, it, it's got to give them some sense of encouragement and hope because they're thinking that someday in the future, they will find themselves married and in a home with a family. So if they see it work, mm -hmm. that's got to make a big difference in their lives. If they yes. see it lived out in a very practical way. Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to impact them greatly. And mm -hmm. so loving, you know, a husband loving his wife, um, you know, a balanced home, uh, peace. Uh, they they see problems, but they see a husband and a wife. Their parents work through those problems and resolve those problems. Mm -hmm. um, all of that's critically important, I think, for the future of young people. The, could we say the word security? Yes. You see, like if a, a twenty five year old who's been raised in a family, and and we we uh, kept the course, you know. The end game is that they would be uh, secure. They would uh, have a good name. Okay, that's not about my reputation as much as it is our nature. I think a reputation is great, but the character, you know, that person has integrity. Uh, that person, I can trust them. That person is not a liar. But let's go back up. Uh, 10 years, they're not 25, they're 15, and they start to lie. So what, what's the parent's responsibility? Um, I think to confront that and, and to point it out and to say, listen, you know, <laughs> you don't want to live uh, your life lying. You want to live your life in truth. So you have to identify it. I mean, obviously, all of us growing up, you know, we... Nobody had to teach us how to lie. <laughs> it came very naturally. Yes. But when it happened, you know, our parents made sure that we knew that it was wrong mm -hmm. and began to teach us at a very young age that, you, you, you know, you cannot do that. That, that. That's not acceptable in this home, in this family, and in society mm -hmm. because they were preparing us to step into society mm -hmm. and to step into the world that we were about to live in. So that was critically important, uh, that they would confront us and not let that slide and not just let any kind of behavior um, pass off as, as acceptable. Yeah, so let's say the parent could be present but actually absent. Yes, yeah. Like, um, I'm looking the other way. Exactly. Okay, so my son has lied. I don't want to confront him. I don't want him to make him feel bad. I don't want him to, I just look, you know, it was a mistake. He, But then he has the habit of it. And now where's the parent? The parent is so uh, what? He's AWOL. Yeah, they're not there. They're not engaged. Man. Because the parent is on what? He's not home. Parent is on social media all the time. Maybe not paying attention. No conversation. No, like, family meal where there is a confrontation and maybe shame mm -hmm. or embarrassment, but then there is forgiveness. Uh, families are, you know, uh, teenagers are famous for wanting their privacy. That's right. Okay, so, why, Mom, why are you looking in my drawers? <laughs> why are you uh, going through my stuff? What's the answer to that? Because I care. Because, because I, I love you, yes, and I don't want to see any harm brought into your life. You know, it, it, it's a terrible thing when parents think about their children, and they think to themselves, "I want to be their friend." They, they, parents are not supposed to be their friends; yeah. they're supposed to be their parents. And maybe even the police sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, if a parent is, uh, let's say, your teenager is doing drugs, they have in their pocketbook. Do you know what the, the the civil law would say that the parent has to be responsible for your child? If your child gets in trouble with the law, it's a reflection on the parent. Yeah, the civil law says that. So the teenager says, "Stay out of my stuff," and we counter and say, "The state of Maryland says I should be in your stuff." that I'm responsible for your life. The state police just gave me a phone call and told me, like, do I know where my child is? 
Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Right? That's the kind so, of involvement and engagement that has to happen. All right. Now, here, here's another thing. I think this program is getting juicy. <laughs> now, now, here's another thing. Let's say uh, quitting. Mm. Your, your 15-year-old daughter or your son, they joined the basketball team, and now they're quitting. What do you think about that? What does the coach think about it? Yeah. I mean, there are always exceptions. You know? Sure. I, I think that I think as parents, sometimes we have to find out what a young person really enjoys and wants to be a part of and wants to participate in. So you got to give them a little, a little leeway to figure yeah. out, is this what you want to... But if you see a pattern of quitting developing, yes. you know, and the, the, everything that they approach, everything that they start to do, they quit... That's when you, you might have a problem and you might want to start addressing that and saying, listen, this is not a good way to approach life because if you take this attitude towards life, well, you know, when you get, you know, into college and you, you're challenged, you want to quit. You're going to get married and there are challenges as there will be in a marriage, you're going to want to quit. And you go to work and you don't like the boss and you want to quit. You're kind of setting yourself up mm. for a, a life of quitting. Yes. And that's and I, I got to say, my man, my dad didn't allow me to quit anything. Yeah, and that's and a good I, thing. I think that because he was World War Two, right? Yeah, that the greatest the man, generation. That, the, that generation, it was, uh, uh, you know, once you get in, once you start, that's it. You're not quitting. You yeah, know? I like that attitude. And, uh, but but I did. I mean, I was in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, and I started to play baseball and. I had to drop the scouting and then uh, the baseball and then and on it goes. But in, in effect, uh, there is something to say. When we say hold, what was the name of the program in the beginning? Like hold the, the line or what was well, it Well, yeah, just to, to help parents uh, stay the stay course. Stay the course. In okay. your so, but what course? I mean, I don't know that parents know what course they are on. And in the local church, this is where we get some direction. I think we're feeding off of other parents. And when we look at a, a family that is, well, in, in really, to be very frank, they're doing a very good job. And you look at their kids and, they're, and you compare and you might say, I'm not doing a good job. Mm. Well, don't quit and don't back off. Just keep in the game, learn a little more, you know, Keep on, you know, keep going in your, your children need a child or your children need uh, some accountability. And we want to work with teachers. We don't want to blame the school. We don't, that's another thing that kids need to learn. Like parents, I'm hooked up with the school and we are in agreement and don't try to drive a wedge between us and the school. We're not on your side unless it is a reasonable argument for it. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, don't do your whining and crying, but you've got to man up, be responsible, get your work done, and face the music. Yeah. Uh, imagine if you didn't take that approach, you would be developing a, the victim's mentality yeah. throughout the course of their lives. It's always somebody else's fault. And isn't know? it everywhere today? It's every. It's blaming everybody you know but yeah there are the winners that are not blaming mm -hmm. and that's where our goal is our yeah. goal is ultimately when they're 25 years old you got a, a good a responsible healthy well-balanced person who more or less has been beaten up learned a lot they've learned stuff they've fallen down they had to get up they couldn't quit and they had to face uh, what 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 life is about yeah and, and, and those kinds of young people, as they continue to develop that attitude, they, they, they live very fruitful, productive, and successful and lives. And happy lives. Happy lives, absolutely. Happy lives. Yeah. Like balanced and happy. They have friends. Yeah. They interact. They're responsible, accountable. Uh, not, you know, it may not look very pretty. Let's say there's a 12-year-old and maybe has, has a disability, but he's learning like he's growing up, he's learning, and and a healthy, well balanced person who has a disability is a great blessing and a great gift, you know. 
And who knows, maybe the disability fades away. You might not even notice it mm. as he lives in an adult life. Yeah. And he's in his place, yeah. wherever. I think it's important, too, that our listeners understand that there's no, there's no perfect parents. Uh, there's no perfect children. There's no perfect families. Everybody's going to make mistakes. So if, if that's your goal, you know, d drop that as a goal. Mm. You're not going to be perfect. And I think sometimes parents yeah. put a lot of pressure on themselves to raise perfect children. Oh, and you have to be careful uh, uh, about that. Yeah. I, I think you can, like you said, you can get a lot of encouragement when you look at families, some other families, and the way they raise children. And yet there's a, a somewhat of a built-in danger there, too. Because I know that when we first you know, started having children and we were in the church, I felt as though there were a few families that were kind of put out in front of us. And essentially, without it being said this way, this is your ideal family. Mm. And then only over time to see that ideal family crumble and mm. fall apart. Yes. Just to get the message, which was, you know, God was saying, I want you to look to me. Okay. I want you to trust me. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you do, if you get your eyes on other people's families, you know, you're not going to either measure up or you'll be better than they are. And then you'll start look down, look, looking down upon them. You don't want that to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, it's... It's like uh, the Bible is so full of, you know, Peter denying the Lord, Mary Magdalene. Uh, we have uh, the Apostle Paul, and, and you know, you have uh, so many pictures, Abraham. And they actually, the family mis dysfunction in the Bible is one of the themes. There was uh, Cain killed Abel. <laughs> Uh, Esau and Jacob didn't get along. Ishmael and Isaac didn't get along. Rebecca and Leah uh, were at odds with, with each other. Hannah and the other woman in the family. Um, David's family is a mess, you know. So we're not talking about, right. you know, like you're, you're going to make it, you know, safely into adolescence. It might happen. It might happen, and if it does, wow! Congratulations. <laughs> I, I <know>. but, Call <laughs> us. <laughs> but, but wait a minute. Think about your teenagers getting into drugs, yeah. teenagers uh, drinking, car accidents, teenagers failing out of school, uh, running away from home, teenagers um, uh, confused, depressed, uh, drug dependent, maybe even prescription drugs anxieties, fears, and all of this. Uh, how about teenagers addicted to social media? We have in our convention, we have a workshop on that with uh, Pastor Pete Wister and Barry Quirk. And um, uh, so let's put that out there. Yes, and da David, again, David's family, Absalom kills his stepbrother. Absalom is hunting for his father to kill his father. This is an uh, incredible mm. reality. So w when, we, when we look at the local church, I need to have a local church. I need to have Bible teaching. I need the book of Proverbs in my life. And I need to realize that my kids need help. And I got to be there. So uh, hold the line, guide them. And be there when they win and be there when they fall. Be there in the good times, be there in the bad times. And, um, and um, may, maybe maybe then we would we just, I guess what we're saying is don't check out as a parent. Don't abandon your family. Don't abandon your kids. Uh, don't abandon the whole idea. But learn in the local assembly of uh, being an investor, of taking time, learn by other examples. Don't be condemned by them, but learn from them. Be inspired by people that are making an effort to uh, have a family. Yeah, absolutely. Well, friends, you can join us if you'd like to share a thought with us. Uh, pick up the phone, dial one of these numbers, and join us live on the broadcast, 800-338-7060. That's toll-free in all of North America and locally. 410-483-3700. You know, you go back to the example in the home uh, with young people. I just I have to relate this story. When we were very young, I remember sitting at the table, 
and I don't exactly recall all of the details, but I know that there was a great deal of tension between my mother and my father. And at that time, there was probably maybe five of us, young, very young at the table, dinner time, and my father was going out the door, and all I remember is a bottle of ketchup being thrown in his direction. And because it was a glass bottle at the time, it smashed and the ketchup was everywhere and my father went out the door. And I just remember that silence and looking at my siblings, like what just happened? <laughs> you know, we, we, we weren't old enough to digest it all and to, 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 to realize what was going on. But I just sensed that after that, my parents must have come together and said, you know what, we can't do that. In front of the, in front of the children because they were traumatized. They we were because I remember that vividly today to this day. Yeah, um, it just shows and you the 60 importance. Sixty years ago. Yeah, it's yeah maybe even more than that. I'm thinking, wow. I, I just remember looking at my brothers and sisters and like we didn't say anything. <laughs> you know, we didn't, I didn't look at my mother and say, "What would you do that for?" It was more like, wow, you know, what's going on? So I think they got together and said, we can never let that happen. And then I don't remember ever them having that kind of tension or conflict in the house again. I mean, uh, it wasn't a perfect house by any stretch of the imagination, but that was not going to happen again. And I think that having peace in, in the home and nobody's lifting up their voices and yelling and screaming or throwing bottles of ketchup at each other, uh, it makes a big difference. You know, yes. when, you're, when you can grow up in a home like that, where, as you said earlier, you have that security. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's very funny. It was. It's yeah, I look back on it. I, I laugh at it now, but not at the moment. I was like, I don't yeah. understand this very much. Yes, right. Yeah. Right, right. Well, right. Um, Pastor Shell, I just, I think our, our, our listeners are aware of some of these issues that, families face today, that children face today, that parents face today, um, about the problems that they're up against. Um, we, we have, society has such a shallow view and understanding of love. Um, you know, this is, I think it contributes to the breakdown of the family today. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, we, we have such an advantage when we are spirit and we are indwelt by the spirit when we attend a church we have such an advantage when we when are, we have a good church we have bible teaching we have examples we have people that are loving praying i mean uh, every morning now eight o'clock in the morning there's so there's people out here in front of the church on the patio at the tables outside uh praying so uh, great advantage, you know, great advantage, direction. Uh, I, I cannot imagine uh, doing this um, without borrowing from the traditional view of a family. Uh, I've, I've got to borrow from that. Or I have a local church where I am realizing that this is the model, this is the model, and the secular world is not, they are giving you other models, and they are messed up. I mean, you, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to figure out that this world is messed up. The Western world is as messed up as ever. I mean, I have no interest in, in uh, listening to the foolishness, the straight out, I mean, these people that are propagating this ideology, the different ideologies that have no roots. There is relativism, moral relativism, and all whatever language you want to use, it's just nuts. There's just no interest in it. So if you are entertaining those ideas that this is all whatever you want, whatever the kids want, you know, Mom, I'm a bowl of cornflakes today, and I would appreciate it that you call me it and not and not he, and the pronouns, and, uh, you know, that, mom, I'm a cat. Yeah, it, it is absurd and ridiculous. Okay, so if you don't have some sense of uh, where you're going and what you want to do, then you, you, need, you need God. Mm -hmm. You need to fear God. You, this is not a game. You think it'll end up well? You think you'll lie down in sorrow? 
You think your heart will be broken. You think that being messed up will lead to order and godliness and what's right. No, it'll go worse. It'll get worse and worse, and your heart will go through a meat grinder. You know, you got to get a grip, grip and get a sense of, of God's reality. You know, we have the traditional family picture, which is the right one, and uh, we have a biblical uh, uh, understanding, and we have a book of wisdom on it, how to behave. Abraham Lincoln was saying uh, the book of Psalms. Abraham Lincoln, wow, what a guy to follow. Mm. The Psalms are written to be worshiping God, and then the Proverbs is so that I can get along with my fellow man. Wow. And I mean, I need I need the book of Proverbs, and uh, and I need to understand. I need wise people around me, and maybe we will we'll see the good results from that. Mm. Imagine a, a, a young person coming home and saying to their parents, you know, a young girl, um, mom, dad, you know, I, I'm I'm really a boy. I mean. What would you say if that if that if that ha- I mean how would you counsel a parent if if they're confronted by their own child by I mean I w- I think I would approach it and say no you're not this yeah. is you you're not living in reality but yeah. today what they hear is oh listen you need to know this we're going to love you no matter how you identify yourself mm-hmm. or what you identify yourself with mm-hmm. but that's that's not really that's not love according to truth. That's that's a, a a false kind of love. Yeah, you know, like you see the billboards today. Love is love. You just got to leave it there. No, love is connected with truth. Yes. And if you separate love from truth, you're going to have a a, a tr- tremendous distortion. Mm-hmm. And this is what we see happening in our culture today. Yes, yes, it's incredible. And a lot of Christian families are heartbroken. Absolutely. And um, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I'm not wa- wanting them to suffer the guilt or condemn themselves for what has happened, but we want to put the blame on our, our social, social, uh, uh, elements, um, by the education they get in the public schools or university by, uh, social media platforms and, and um and their friends and what the chatter is and whatever but the parenting has to be there we have to like not give up and we need to continue and we need to uh help them because you know whenever you have a lie you have the effect of the lie when we have we contradict reality we're going to suffer so there's somebody's going to be suffering and, and wh- who, whoever is believing in that and embracing that is going to produ- produce pain. And that's uh, the thing that uh, we can't quit. That's right. We can't quit. We have to be there and, um, and give, be guide, guide, give guidance and do it in an early age, way early, way early. Uh, we kind of got behind, behind the ball, I think. We, we kind of lost our, our way, didn't really realize what was happening. But... Uh, Warnings, uh, counsel, guidance. A little girl should be loved by her dad, uh, cared for. Uh, the feminine side of her developed and cultivated, as well as she can be a tomboy. But if she's a tomboy, it doesn't mean she's a boy. That's right. Like uh, some of these tomboys, when they were twelve years old or fourteen, they turned into be- beauty queens one day. Right. You know, right. like yeah. like give them room. Yeah. Like, don't label them. This is propaganda. This is error. This is a big problem in our society. And and we and I blame our leadership. I blame, um, I think some of these people that are promoting this, they have a huge platform and a lot of power, and we should bring it to light. Yeah. And I think Americans are fighting back. Yeah, praise God. Yes. yes. They are, and we yes. should continue to do so. We mentioned, too, we touched upon it for a moment about society's uh, preoccupation with the media today. Um, you know, the, the Nielsen uh, Media Research Group has just recently come out and said that there are more televisions than there are Americans. 
in our in our country today. <laughs> More televisions than there are people. That is incredible. We know that the population is around 330 million people in this country, and there's more TVs than that. Mm -hmm. um, the average amount of time a young person spends in front of a television, I've heard it's anywhere between five to seven hours a day. What are they getting? What's the mm -hmm. message? That, because there's always a message mm -hmm. that's being imparted to them. I can't even imagine and then add to that the cell phones, the computer screens, and everything that they're taking in. Our young people today, they need a biblical moral compass. I could imagine they will be lost without that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We've got to be able to get, get these biblical principles in front of them uh, in a practical way. Preaching alone, in other words, parents preaching to their children, that's not going to cut it. There's got to be a relationship. There's got to be a bridge of communication that has to happen between parents and their children. Yes. Um, yeah. I. I mean, the TV issue is a big one. I mean, a lot of families they have more than one TV in the house, you know. Um, and then I think poor people. One of the first things that they do is they get a TV. Uh, so it's like for everybody, rich and poor, and multiply the TVs and so on. And then you have, uh, you know, the social media uh, issue. And from, uh, what was the iPhone invented in 2006, was it? I'm not sure. And then uh, the, the numbers that, the, the, the numbers of depression, uh, youth suicides, um, uh, increased usage of pharmaceuticals for anxiety and fear and so on is linked with this social media uh, tool. Uh, so I, I don't know that children are smart enough or disciplined enough to put it down. Put it down. It's addictive. Yeah. So there are parents that have a box at the house, and when the kids come home, the phone goes there. I've been in parts of the world where kids don't have phones. Mm. I mean, the, the country is poor. They don't have phones, you know. And then there are places where even if they have a phone, they only are allowed to use it X number of minutes a day. But I feel that in America, because we are, we are very soft and we are not so uh, demanding and we're not putting the control on the children, then um, we, we just let them do it. And they get addicted, and they get bad uh, uh, bad influences, and it's not controlled. So that that's a good subject. Like, where where is the parenting responsibility when it comes to the iPhone or yeah. the smartphone? Yeah, absolutely. I know that when we have our Camp Life program, which we do every summer, um, one of the first things that we, well, we print it, and, and it's in our you know, registration packet that, you know, you cannot have your cell phones. You cannot use your cell phones. You might bring them to camp, but you can't use them at camp. And we haven't bent on that. We haven't uh, compromised that. And it's been such a blessing. Yes. And, and we ask the kids, you know, if this is a problem for you, then just give us your cell phone. We'll put it in the office. We'll lock it. It will be safe. No one will go near it until camp concludes, and then you'll get your cell phone back. They, their lives are contained in that cell phone today. Yeah. And by asking them to say, give us your phone, that's like us asking them, give us your life <laughs> and trust us with it for a week. But yet we see the results. We can see kids thoroughly enjoying themselves and learning how to have a good time and, and to be present and to be engaged with other campers and staff members without your cell phone. Mm -hmm. And it's so refreshing to mm -hmm. see that it can still be done, but it isn't easy. It's almost like you got to get the, you know, it's like you need the jaws of life to, to, get, to get them to release their cell phones. But they really realize after a week without it, wow, I, I can survive without it. Yeah, yeah. And even, uh, you know, uh, um, I would say uh, that parents that find other hobbies or activities, parents that find uh, balance maybe in a creative way uh, with their, by themselves, and then children can gravitate. Let's say a, a man has a little hobby shop. He does a little bit of work, and uh, maybe he's interested in the machines uh, 
fixing a, a lawnmower or working on a project, building a birdhouse or uh, parent or drawing or making pictures. They have a little hobby room and then incorporate the children into those things. Yes. I mean, um, women that are cooking, uh, making things, you know, to give you time with your child, athletic things, kayaking, fishing, hiking, and so on. And dro drop the phone thing. Drop the phone thing. Control it and then also have conversation. Ride in the car without a phone. Ride in the car. Walk, talk. Talk about the cows out in the field. Talk about the sky, the stars, etc. So sometimes the children could be bored because the parents are boring. Mm -hmm. And maybe the parents are the worst example for how to handle the social media, you know, pandemic, if you want to call it that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know how healthy it is for us. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it is. No, it's, it doesn't seem like it's healthy for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's like any benefit, any tool, uh, if it's used the right way, yeah, you know? Exactly. Like money is great, but if it's wrong, wrong way, it's a, it's a, it's a plague. But if it's used the right way, what a blessing. And I think the, the uh, smartphone is an incredible invention and a great tool, but a terrible master. Yeah. yeah. And I think we have to have the kind of conversations that we've been talking about today in the broadcast with our children. They may be difficult, yeah. maybe uncomfortable, but you got to have those conversations. Another thing I just want to throw out because we're ending, uh, silence without a phone you're sitting at a table and there's silence and it seems awkward but but that's okay yep you don't have to be always talking you don't have to always be entertaining you don't have to always be looking for entertainment that's right there is no entertainment we're sitting at a table and we're all quiet yeah and it might even be a little bit boring but it's good for you yeah just yeah. to be present yeah yeah right well, friends, uh, thanks so much. We've reached the end of uh, yet another broadcast here on the Grace Hour, and we want to remind you, of course, that there is one more broadcast coming up tomorrow, the Friday edition of our program that's coming up tomorrow. And thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to the broadcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. We'll wrap up this theme tomorrow right here in the Grace Hour. We hope you'll join us then. Until then, may God bless you.